thank you so much for coming out today on this gorgeous Saturday and to our friends joining us on Zoom. Thank you for being with us as well. Today, we are excited to have with us author Stephen Cogen. I first met Stephen last year when he was giving his lecture on his book, Master Thieves, The Boston Gangsters Who Pulled Off the World's Greatest Art Heist. To say that I was in awe of his many accomplishments would be an understatement. <laughs> Stephen is one of the most acclaimed investigative reporters in the country. A 40-year veteran of the Boston Globe, he is the paper's former Washington bureau chief and a founding member of its investigative spotlight team. Kurgin has won more than 25 national and regional awards, including the Pulitzer Prize on three occasions. He is a graduate of Suffolk Law School and lives in Boston, but we have him today to give this wonderful lecture on solving the Lady of the Dunes. Thank you, Amy. I um, I hope I asked most of you, why would you come here <laughs> off of a gorgeous day like today off the beach? And you and you gave me great, great answers. And, and I've been working on this talk. It's not a book, a story, talk. Uh, since uh, when did you call? February. February. Amy said, uh, we had so much fun last year when I talked on what I really know about, which is the theft from the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum. <laughs> Amy said, what do you got? <laughs> so, uh, I had one, I had a couple of other stories uh, thinking about. I looked at my my bag and I had another talk in there about covering Woodstock back in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a fun one. <laughs> but and this, but this um, is not such a fun one. Um, now this is about the Isabella. This is about the Lady of the Dunes uh, case. Um, let me show you one photograph, which is stunning, and it's historical because it was taken almost fifty years ago today. You can see the outline of a body. Uh, and it is in the Cape Cod National uh, National Seashore, uh, and it is the one who became quickly known as the Lady of the Dunes. And uh, so many years later, in 2014, my very good friend at the Boston Globe, uh, Tom Farragher, Tom had been promoted from chief of the spotlight team uh, to a columnist. Metropolis for the globe. And uh, that's a heavy responsibility because you twice a week you have got to intrigue, satisfy, outrage, interest um, a half a million people who are still buying the globe, mostly online, but as a metro columnist. Did he take me with one question? Uh, can I come, can I uh, call up Meredith, your niece Meredith, in uh, Provincetown and ask her, do an update on the Lady of the Dunes? And I told Tom what Meredith had always told me, um, she being at the time the, the detective uh, for the uh, for the Provincetown Museum, not Provincetown, Provincetown Police Department. Um, I'll let you know once I know but not a day, not an hour, not a moment before. This is a police investigation, and I've been working diligently on, then it was three years, and it would turn into 23 years that she be, or she was working on the case. It's an extraordinary case. For nearly a half a century, local and Massachusetts State Police had sought to learn the identity that woman there. She had been brutally murdered and left beneath some, beneath some brush on the dunes of Provincetown, just a few hundred yards away from the Atlantic Ocean. Meredith 
Detective Lover, who was with us today, had taken the job as in Provincetown in part because she knew how legendary this case had become. She had given up her job as a public defender in Massachusetts Committee for Public Counsel Services, our public defenders. Meredith had been a active, uh, thriving member of their staff in, in Boston, working at both the Superior and District Court level. But she wanted to do something that she felt was meaningful. And at that point in her life, she said police work is what was calling me. She had done some police work uh, in other departments and she applied and got in 2011 to this position in Provincetown and took over this case, this lady of the Dunes case. You know, the, the, the gruesome details are legendary. On July 26, just a day or two ago, 50 years ago, the new body of a mature woman was found by a 14-year-old girl walking her dog on the remote dunes of Provincetown. As extraordinary it is because we're only one peel of the of the onion away from having a, a relation who's at the core of the story, the sister of that 14-year-old now late, late sister is with us uh, today, uh, Alyssa uh, Metton. The woman's head had been nearly decapitated, her hands severed at the wrist and taken away. So there were no fingerprints. Her body lay atop a beach towel in a pair of men's jeans that appeared to have been, were, were laying under, under her, been by her. And she had seemed to have been murdered somewhere else and left there. The, that, that mystery has never been solved. But who she was was the key issue. And uh, right from the start, uh, the case depended on that identification. He is solving the murder of who killed her, but also how had this murder happened and who was she? For, at the outset, the, uh, the Department of Police Chief, uh, Jimmy Beats, uh, took over the case. And as I recall, he always had, of all things, a, a skull on his desk that he would take with him to other police departments to see if there was any recognition. There had to be something that, that would cause someone to give a spark of information that would lead to a clue that would lead to this identification. Nothing. At one point, there was a sense that maybe the Bulger gang had something to do with it. No. At another case, another point, it was a sense that maybe this um, uh, this uh, serial murder had something to do with it. He was brought in. He made all sorts of claims. He didn't have, he didn't have anything to do with it. Well, in the late 80s, the case was taken over by a detective that preceded Meredith, Warren Tobias. Warren Tobias got a call. As you know, there's been coverage of this case for decades. Warren Tobias got a call from um, uh, Mary Richardson of Carnival. hope some of you remember Mary. She was a pal of mine. I didn't remember this until I interviewed Warren about this. But Warren said that Mary and Chronicle had done several um, installments about the case. And, uh, you know, but if you can understand that signal goes only as far as the Berkshires. So while people in the Berkshires knew about Lady the Dunes and there was a missing woman, there was an unidentified woman whose body had been found on the Dunes, people beyond the Berkshires didn't know about it. And that was too bad because the woman had come from far away uh, to wind up on the dunes. What Mary Richardson said to Warren though was, there's a way, there's a new way of solving identification issues. 
and that's DNA research. And I know a professor um, at the Bay State Community College in Wellsburg, and he has a lab there, he's the head of the lab there, and he is steeped, and this is in the early 90s now, in information about how this DNA research works. At the outset, and uh, science is not my strength, so I may miss a few buttons here, but at the outset, Meredith took over in 2011, and at the outset, the connections were made through your mother. Uh, uh, you only, if to, in order to make a kind of who is this person, you had to get your DNA sample, but that would only match with the mother of the person whose identity you were finding. And um, Meredith had a tip early on uh, that she had gotten from California that a couple, a young couple, had passed through um, passed through Provincetown and had been found to be missing in the California foothills. And did Meredith know anything about this? And uh, Meredith said, well, who's the woman? Is the woman, do you know who the woman is? And he said, no, we have a name for the woman. And Meredith was able to find the woman's grandmother and was able to take, at this point, Meredith had the DNA of the Lady of the Dunes. So she's trying to find the match for the Lady of the Dunes DNA, but you only can do it at that point through the mother. Merit Meredith found the mother of the grandmother of this woman whose uh, identity was known, but they didn't have a body. But at least she was able to find the grandmother and was able to get DNA from the grandmother. It did not match the Lady of the Dunes. So Meredith and her Warren Tobias, her investigator, uh, decided to go back to ground zero. During that years of development from 2011 to 2022, when ultimately this case gets solved by DNA research, the science exploded. Science that you and most of us have taken advantage of to find, I haven't found my lost twin brother, but I'm hoping you found at least your fifth, fourth, and third cousins through the DNA that you put on 23andMe and uh, Ancestry.com. That archive that built up over those 10, 12 years, that became the, the library that the search would be conducted on. Meredith stayed with the DNA research for that 11 years. And to anyone she spoke with, she said, this case will be solved, but it'll be, have to be through DNA. The problem was, it turned out to be, that the case was solved. And when it was solved, it was solved through DNA by the FBI. Meredith went to the FBI late in 2021, 2022, and said to them, you're missing a stitch in California, as legendary a case in California, the Golden State Killer, a case that involved numerous murders, numerous assaults, numerous rapes, had been solved with DNA research. And she went to the FBI, she was working with an FBI agent here in, 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 uh, on the Cape, Jeff Kelly, terrific, uh, engaging the FBI agent. And she said to him, you're missing out. You're, if you would do a search of available DNA profiles, you might be able to find, because we have something, we have a profile. We are able to get a profile of Lady of the Dooms. They had her remains, but we don't have anyone who can get it on these websites. 
And uh, there's another law enforcement website that was used. And lo and behold, the match was found. Why? Because what they found on the on the uh, uh, on the websites was her son's DNA. I'll get into who she was and how she had suffered this brutal murder. But her son, whom she had had in, as a youth and put up for adoption, he got interested in what who was my original my birth family. Who are these people? How do I find them? And he entered his onto uh, one of the um, public websites. And he doesn't find his mother's because his mother's hasn't been entered yet. But he does find a woman in, he's in Michigan, a woman in Tennessee. And she seems to have been related to him. Her DNA profile is similar to his. And he reaches out to her because he's interested, not just in his mother, but who's my family. And he connects with her. She had, this was a niece of the Lady of the Dunes. So here we have, by 2016, 2017, we have the Lady of the Dunes' son and the Lady of the Dunes' niece, both in searching for family members. In fact, the niece was looking for her, her aunt, the Lady of the Dunes didn't come up because her profile had not been entered on the public public websites yet. Well, once the FBI did the Eureka, this is, comes to my uh, point of uh, uh, that this case has not been celebrated and this angle has not been known well enough. Her original detective on the case, Warren Tobias, has said to me, if the FBI in the DA's office had only worked hand in glove with the Provincetown police, this case would have been solved. He told me this two years ago, 20 years ago. Now, I'm not sure the science was there 20 years ago to make the connection, but certainly they would have been hotter on the trail than having to solve it in 2022. It would have been. They call them in law enforcement, some of you here are in law enforcement, it's called a task force. And you put together members of the various departments to work a single case. And that wasn't done here. Instead, there was almost resentment that Meredith was spending was working so hard, so diligently, so making such advances on this case. Why? Because the district attorney at the time, um, the district attorney O'Keefe, he did not like that science was entering into the investigation. And he specifically didn't like that, as he told me, an academic was working the case. Meredith had continued to work both with Dr. Jackson before he passed away in 2016 and um, an equally important individual in genetic research, Bruce Badoli of North Texas University. He, has, he became the single most important authority on DNA research for criminal investigations. And that's what solved this case was the DNA research that, that went into, into solving the case. Meredith didn't care about the credit. She just wanted the work to be recognized. So much so that when a member of, uh, of law enforcement from the Cape, um, Art Roderick, a former US Marshal, he had started his own DNA he was working with a production team, making documentaries, and um, was putting together documentaries with groups of people, uh, making great advances, both in the investigation side, but also bringing them to life. Well, Meredith and I became, uh, they, they became aware of each other, I think probably he knew already, 
And they talked. And she said to him, go to District Attorney Oki and convince him that this is the way, that this science is the way to solve this case. And probably two years before the case was solved, uh, I went to, he knew, he knew uh, the district attorney, and he said to him, let's do it this way. You give me the, the tissue that we can get her DNA from, and I will make the connection, and you will make the announcement. But at least we'll get this case, historic case, solved. Maybe on, on an overnight, um, uh, O'Keefe uh, thought about it, but that was it. He did not want to give uh, the control of the investigation over to a private party. I think Tobias is on to something. Warren Tobias is on to something when he says that this case could have been solved years before it was solved. Had there been cooperation, assistance among the departments. Meredith certainly was not getting it from her chief. Um, uh, 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 he had told her probably midway in her uh, 12 year, 15 year, 10 year, no more overtime for working on Lady of the Jones. Why? Because he said, look at the state law. And certainly the state law says criminal investigations, homicide investigations will be done by the district attorney's office. Meredith, as I told you, is a lawyer. She went to her law books. Remember where this case, where this murder took place? National Seashore. Who has jurisdiction over the National Seashore? The FBI. That's why she always felt comfortable that her communication, her working with the FBI, even though the district attorney's office wasn't interested in using the DNA path to solving the case, she felt this case, this murder took place on the um, on a national seashore. So I can, without stepping on any toes, which she probably was, um, work with the FBI in solving this case. And late in, 20, uh, in mid 2022, uh, she realizes that there is a task force working on the case in California with the um, Golden State Killer. In fact, it's on that task force, there's an author, a woman who knows DNA research so well that she's written books about it. So that's how cooperation worked to solve that case. And when she saw her, she picks up the Meredith picks up the phone, talks to the uh, to the the the, uh, the author, the DA, the the FBI investigator on the case, and said, "Will you work with my with the FBI agent who has responsibility for our case here?" And he says. I'll work with anyone you want. That's a legendary case. 50 years it hasn't been solved. Oh, then 46. Ridiculous. And before long, that FBI agent is talking to uh, Meredith's FBI agent, the FBI agent she's working with, Jeff Kelly, and it happens. The, the connection is made. How was it made? When they put this woman's DNA online, and I don't have the exact site. They first they gave the tissue to a company called Authram, O T H R A M. Authram does does pull out of uh, the most subtle of places. Um, do your DNA can get DNA profile from the most subtle of places. What they had. What they had sent to uh, Authram was the skull, which is allegedly where they, uh, reportedly where they got the DNA profile for her, but also tissue that Meredith had secured 
back in 2013. How can she secure it? Back in um, 2013, soon after taking over the case, she was working with the um, genetic investigator, Bruce Badoli, Dr. Badoli, and he and he she was told that your the two profiles that you have from tissue that you have from the Lady of the Dunes that has been on file with your medical examiner's office, they don't match. So understand the two tissues that they have, the DNA coming from them doesn't match. So we don't, they don't have in 2013 a good profile, a usable profile for the Lady of the Dunes. How do we, how do we solve this, this situation, this dilemma? Meredith gets the approval of her then chief gets approval from her board of health in the town, Provincetown, and with Dr. Jackson's assistance, uh, they do a, um, a disinterment. And Meredith from that gets better tissue that they can determine from her DNA profile. And that's the, the those two pieces of tissue, the skull and what Meredith had had gotten that day in 2013, that's the pro, that's the material that they sent, Othram sends in uh, studies to get the profile. And when they put that profile on the public, it's not the public site, I think it's a federal, an FBI site that they had, they come up with the two hits, her niece, and her son. And within days, the FBI goes to both houses and imagine what the shock was. I mean, they had the long, uh, Meredith in her early in taking on this case had gone to the, uh, gone to the grave at St. Peter's Cemetery in Farmerstown. And now, there's a, there's a little headstone there, Lady of the Dunes. I'm going to get you home to your family. Said that to her. Don't worry, I'll get you home to your family. So, in 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 in, in this was a fruition of getting her home to her family, of being able to get usable tissue that then was put on the the websites, and there you get the connection to her son and her niece. FBI went and they checked it again. F FBI went to both homes and talked to both the son and the niece, took new DNA from both of them and looked at it. And they said, we've got the connection. Nothing was, this is back in the summer of 2022, nothing was said until Halloween day, no, Halloween day, 2022, three or four days before the FBI had sat down with O'Keefe, state police, Meredith, one or two others, and they made the big reveal at, a, at, at, at their offices that we found her, we know who she is. And, you know, it's, it's amazing when you think, and they have the announcement at the FBI headquarters. Meredith was told at that meeting by the two FBI agents, Kelly and the forensic specialist for the FBI, she and Monday, the, 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 uh, the press conference will be Monday at the FBI headquarters. Uh, again, she had stepped on some toes in getting this to the FBI. She hadn't made friends. Her chief had said, we're not paying you. And the DA said, we don't like the way you're going after this. And in response, Meredith said, you don't like how I'm going after this. In 1987, 
when Warren Tobias was a detective, he came to your office and asked for, because we knew that we didn't have a good DNA profile. He asked for the towels. He asked for the blankets. He asked for the jeans that her, she laid on. He thought he could get good profile. He could get good DNA profile, workable profile, off of those pieces of clothing that was at her grave. That, excuse me, at her resting spot. And when he went to the to the uh, to the state police and asked for the material, he was told, "No, we've thrown that away. With no use. We've got. We, we know what it looked like. We know the sizes. We've thrown that away." Understand. Your, the hat you're wearing, the shirt you're wearing, there's DNA profile, your DNA profile can be drawn from that. So when Warren Tobias says this case should have been known 20 years before, it could have been. And my sadness as an investigative reporter is for promise. They had people working on this case. They had people committed to this case from the Provincetown Police Department. And those people should have been at that announcement on Halloween day, excuse me, Halloween uh, a day in 2022. But the chief didn't invite them because they had bucked the system. Well, Meredith had given her oath to the woman buried beneath in St. Peter's Cemetery. And that's how this case was solved. She didn't get any announcement, you know, and she didn't get any uh, coverage. You know, we follow, I know our limitations as reporters. The people who talk to the people who get quoted. And the uh, District Attorney of Beef got quoted, the FBI got quoted, Robin Stone Police did not get quoted. Uh, the chief would not return phone calls. I know blow reporters were calling him to get, what's the involvement of your department? Was not answering any calls and told records. You're not to answer any phone calls. You're not to answer any questions. He did not want. Why? Because he would have been bucking the district attorney's version of the case. There's only one version of the case. And that came through DNA. And DNA was something that uh, Meredith Lowell and Warren Tobias uh, brought to this case, turned over to the FBI, and we got it solved. So let me just for a second say who, who, who they found this woman was. What I like her is, is she reminds me so much of Barrett. <laughs> She's an independent thinker. Um, she grew up in Tennessee. Uh, I went down there and visited her family. In fact, I went down and they had come to Boston. They had come to Cape Cod. This is a picture of her as when she was a kiddo in, in Tennessee. Um, her her um, mother died in the early, she was born in 1938, mother died in 1943, and um, when she moved in, his, his, her father's, um, her stepmother didn't like the kids, so she moved in with her grandmother, and um, she had a sort of a hard scrabble um, uh, youth, and um, she married at 13, and, uh, and, uh, but didn't have any children, uh, but by about 20, she was looking to leave Tennessee, looking to make her own mark in life, and went to Michigan and got a job uh, in a production line um, with, with an with a, um, automotive company, and had a baby, a son, and, but there's so much I don't know about her life, but decided that she was going to move on. This is now in the early 60s, uh, late 50s, early 60s, and she says, I'm going to California. You know, she heard a, she heard a Beach Boys song, and she was going, <laughs> like all of us. Um, and she put her son, not up for adoption, she gave her son to her foreman, 
who was the foreman of her of her production line. And uh, and the boy was raised in a family just like all of us. Um, and she moved to California. And this is who she was uh, in California, in uh, West West Los Angeles. Uh, stayed there. Brought her nieces and nephews over. Her uncles came to visit her, and and um, between then and uh, in 1974. Uh, one thing that I, being an investigative reporter, you go to the clips, and if you can't find anything in the clips, you go to the courthouses. And I paid to have someone to go to the courthouse, and I found a, um, a, a an event that, that she had been warned by the uh, Los Angeles uh, Police Department, or not just she, but the owner of the restaurant that she was working at had been warned that uh, they had to stop um, going topless in <laughs> delivering their food. <laughs> and the owner, a little article in the LA Times that said, the owner's response was, I had trouble paying my cooks. I'm now make I'm now selling four thousand dollars worth of meals <laughs> every week. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Well, uh, uh, Ruth Marie Terry, I work at, at the restaurant. And um, in 1974, next time we see any documents on her, I I find a marriage ticket in. Um, in uh, Reno, Nevada. She and uh, a man who would, this fellow here, um, a guy, Muldavin, M-U-L-D-A-B-I-N, uh, are married, getting married in um, February, 1974. And uh, they drive, uh, he's an antique, uh, the antique dealer. He also works for a company um, that he was quoted in a story in 1980, working for a company um, uh, long after her death. Uh, and I called the company, found the new owner, and I asked him to check his files uh, on what he had for Maldavid, because I'm Maldavid has been now been accused of this murder. And there had been murders before. In fact, as early as 1960, he had been married to a woman living in Seattle, disappears from there, and the Seattle police later find remnants of his wife and her daughter uh, in his sewer system. So uh, uh, Ruth, uh, uh, Ruth Marie Terry had made a bad choice on a husband. They also, they drive east, though, and they wind up in Tennessee at her family's home. She hasn't been home since, since the late 50s. And she pulls in, in what I find interesting, a thang, T-H-A-N-G. Anybody ever heard of a thang? It's a VW. Big wheels. And um, and and she greets her family, introduces her. He's much older than she. Introduces her. He's an antique dealer, and we're going north to uh, Boston, uh, and we're going to the Cape Cod, and we're going to do some antiquing there. We don't. There's no indication she had ever been to the Cape, but he does have history on the Cape. His family had bought his father and bought property on the east end of Provincetown from the telephone company in the late 40s and early 50s. And if you follow the, he divided up the big tract of land that he bought from the telephone company and uh, sold, made a tiny profit. He lived there sort of on and off. And how I know that is be every six months he would send a, a, a letter to the Provincetown advocate. That's right, the advocate. Uh, and uh, with a, you know, another music that he, this is the father, uh, uh, not Guy. Um, 
but they come, the presumption is, uh, they come to Cape Cod and T. And that's the last they heard. I've gone up and down, talked to a few old timers, my contemporaries <laughs> uh, uh, in Farmerstown uh, to see if there might have been a memory of Moldavian. Um, but that's where the that's where the trail goes cold. There is supposedly a list, 50 line, 50 pages long, of everyone who entered into the Cape Cod National Seashore. You had to check in in the, your name and your registration number. Uh, as I understand it, that's been poured over. We can't find a connection to see the date that my, but my presumption is in the the, 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 new, the the new district attorney has clo closed the murder case, saying that Maldavin, uh, who passed away in 2002, um, uh, that he, he had murdered uh, along with his earlier wife and stepdaughter. He had, he was the he was the murderer of Lady of the Dukes. I'm going back to the issue. Shelley Murphy is a legendary law, law, best law enforcement reporter uh, that I know of uh, for, for the Boston Globe. And Shelley has studied any number of these cases and more and more and more of them are being solved through DNA research. Um, but Shelley says the reason why the ones are being solved <coughs> as they are is because there was a clock at the beginning, who cared about the case and kept every piece of evidence and kept every piece where you could get a DNA profile. And that's <laughs> the, the cases that are being, being discovered now. It's those cases. And the honor needs to go as well to the FBI who's doing the Eureka searches now and coming up with Eureka's but to the cops who kept every piece of clothing, every tissue that you could get a DNA profile that you could put online. And I think Shelly was talking about my niece, when I was over. Um, you know, um, the honor also comes in this way. Uh, success has a a thousand parents. And, and, and as we know, failure is, is, is up for adoption. But <laughs> failure, success, everyone's responsible. Success. Uh, hopefully, I'm setting the record straight here for Meredith and, or uh, for Warren Tobias for Roderick uh, is. Is hurt, and um, but the state recognized the state last year through the work of uh, Middlesex County District Attorney uh, put more money into the state police budget. Why? To enhance their state police's DNA research. That to me tells me that. The trail, the, the path that that the investigators were on in working this case as a DNA case, law enforcement had tried everything else. You know, they had gone to every police department and they had answered every phone. My, we haven't seen our daughter since, our granddaughter since. Is there any chance this could be her, the lady of the dunes? They chased on every one of them. And the way to solve this case was DNA, which is, so once a facility, a DNA facility is, um, is established for law enforcement <laughs> here in Massachusetts, as I think it's inevitable because this is the, this is the, the pointy edge of the sword for, for law enforcement. This is how to solve cases. Uh, Somewhere in there, there'll be recognition that Tobias 
to meet for lower work because they're the ones who solve this case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any question? Thank you. Like, let me just go through these just for interest. In the front, please, I want to hear you. So this was the uh, this the cemetery uh, of St. Peter's, where the Lady of the Dunes um, remains were, were buried. This is a photograph uh, that Meredith had worked uh, religiously with the Boston Police Department, the best sketch artist um, uh, in 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 Massachusetts was there and she was able to get that but look I showed it to I had since I've gotten to know the Terry family and I showed it to one of the nephews and he looked at the sketch and he says that's my aunt and uh, her, her real life is on the other side this is Bruce Badoli he is the you know the the lab that did the uh, the research, the DNA research on Lady of the Dunes, Othram, he's on their board of trustees now. This guy is so well established. And it's only because of his studiousness and, uh, uh, and um, that this crime prevention tool is being so widely used now. And this is, you know, many of you know, this is the dunes nearby the where the body was found. This is, uh, the family came, the Terry family, once the, um, the, the, the news got out in October uh, 2022, the Terry family came to Provincetown uh, to meet um, uh, uh, Meredith and other members who had worked the case. And uh, it was lovely. Uh, that uh, her her son also was there. Let me tell you, my kicker is this is the family here. Uh, the son is the is the Bob Seeker lookalike on the left side, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the family uh, they're all coal miners and they're all big, they're all big guys. No, uh, I guess that's it. So, um, please, your questions. Thank you. Young lady. I'm not from here. Um, what are you doing here? <laughs> I was trained by the district attorney, and I don't know what happened. Was he recalled? Because no. it seems to me no, that. Story never DNA, knows. This is the story. DNA has been there for quite a few years, not just not, on this case. Right. How many cases were not solved or not handled correctly because he was a stubborn ass? <laughs> uh, may, I have a look um, I don't know. That is, that's a good question. Um, you know, we, you're not from here. I guess you have to be from here. I'm not from here either. Uh, so I don't know how to answer that question. How is he, you know, he's no longer the district attorney, but he stepped down, he retired. He, uh, but has never been called. You know, I, I sought him out for an interview uh, and I was told, no, he's not gonna talk, he's not gonna talk. But then I talked to someone who wanted to talk for him. And he just said, I did not want, and the state police did not want to have to work with an academic. And that's how this Dr. Bruce Jackson was seen as an academic, not as a resource. And out in the Golden State Killer, anyone who had the background was included into the task force. But uh, we're not from here. Let's find some uh, some locals who might be able to edify us, uh, elucidate why that happened. How, how was it determined that the husband killed her? I think just by process of elimination, you know, I think that 
He came back from in 74. He visited with the family in February 74, came up here, and then came back uh, to the family in Tennessee and said, we're split up. We had an argument, and she's gone her own way. I don't know where she is. And, um, and you know, they, they uh, one, I think her brother uh, went out to California where she was living and talked to people out there, but he couldn't make any heads or tails off it. But when the family came here in 2023, they wanted whatever remains were left because Emeritus Farms going to get you back to the family. Some of the remains went with his son, her son, and others, most, most of it, I think, went with the family. And they have a plot in Tennessee, uh, Whitwell, Tennessee. Was that a mugshot of him, or was that just pictures of him? That was pictures of him back in the day, newspapers at the time. There's an incredible website called uh, Web Sleuthers. And uh, they were, they've got more information on this case, uh, but not from here. The trail ended here. There was no one here who was talking about him or them being here. And there's got to, come on, 1974, it's okay, 50 years ago, but there's people who remember something. But we, we still don't know. Uh, I've knocked on many a door. In fact, I was walking up from the, the cemetery one time and a woman my age, I said, hey, I, I want to talk to you. <laughs> so, and I asked her, I said, how long have you lived here? And she's lived here a long time in, in Farmerstown, but she had no recollection of the, uh, of the Moldavid family when they were buying property. Do you have a question? Yeah, my question was answered actually where her remains are now. Yeah, they the son uh, um, uh, scattered them some on the dunes. Yeah. Where, and he's a terrific kid. Kid, he's in the 60s. Terrific. <laughs> uh, yeah, we hope they're all kids today. <laughs> uh, um, but, uh, but he was so appreciative once he heard it. What had gone into this case? What the P-Town police had done? Um, he was <laughs> so appreciative uh, of the work uh, that. Uh, did he have any recollection of his mother? He, he did not, and that's why. What he not as much of her as mother. He wanted to find her family. That's why he. I think he put his on. The lease was 2013, and he maybe 2018. And luckily, they found each other. He found her family. That's what he was looking for. He was just looking for his mother. Let me say he didn't know his mother was missing until he talked to her family in Tennessee. He's a missionary. He talked to her family because they made the connection. Sure. You know, we're going for our twin brothers, the fifth cousin. <laughs> Love it. I'm so glad you talked about Meredith because uh, I think it was released this week. I watched it. Kathy Curran did a documentary yes, yeah. and it's on YouTube. Yes. And it's amazing how all the discussion is about the former police chief and his son and how great they are. He, he was. They probably did. Yeah, me too. Yeah. But it's I think what it's I think, the piece about the folks that's yeah, I think what I need the most, I saw that piece, was the state police were pulling out of boxes of evidence, files. Those are files of Meredith. Gate. You know, every two years, three years, they come to Meredith in her farmer's town office and we want to see everything you got. And she dutifully Xerox everything and turn it over to say state police did do one very important thing. They flew out after because they this is as I said, there is a law that says, and the DA was going into this law, that homicides are the responsibility of the district attorney's office and the state police who work with each of those offices. So 
they felt that this is our case. Meredith, you know, was debate. Well, since it happened on federal ground, really the FBI case. So she was able to make her connections to the FBI. But had they, you know, worked together as a team, and the, 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 the state police had gone out to both uh, to Tennessee, and I don't know if they went out to California, but they went to confirm what the FBI was finding on DNA. They wanted to, they would track how they had a name of a murder victim in a murder, alleged potential murder of her, her, her husband. So they wanted to follow up on the investigation. And that information led to the new district attorney um, to, um, to say case closed. He did. Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious because it sounds like the lack of cooperation between different departments was the big uh, brick wall in solving this. I mean, you've done investigative reporting right, right, work. Right, right. I'm, I'm sure you might have seen this before between I local county but and... You're, hi, any police officers here? One police officer. So I'm told that they work when your chief buys into it. Because anybody's going to work. If you you got a case and you're going to work it, I want to get credit for my work, right? That's about, that's the one the reporter once told me. It's all about the, 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 the digits. It's all about the DEA, FBI, uh, SEC. Get, make sure you get the identifying agency in. But that all depends on the chief who's giving up that investigator to work with this task force. And unfortunately, Meredith's chief did not believe in her working on the case or even solving the case. He, you know, yeah, if it got solved, you're eating. But understand, this is Provincetown. This is Provincetown, which is a, a community that has lived with this curse of this murder for an, the longest unidentified victim in Massachusetts history was Ruth Marie Terry. And, but he did not want, so it's the DA's case, let the DA solve. And the DA says, yeah, I'll, I'll solve it with my state police, but we're not gonna solve it with uh, uh, DNA. We're, we're not gonna let outsiders, this academic, work with us. They didn't have, and they didn't have the way with all. Really, the FBI had the way with to, to solve this case, which is why Meredith went to him. Thank you. What prompted the authorities to look into the husband in regards to his previous wife and stepdaughter's disappearance? Let's see. I'm going to tell you how it works for the investigative report. You call everybody. You know, and when you see that she had just been married, you you, got, you know her, you go to her family, they say she, she was just here and she was married to this guy. She was talking about her recent marriage. Then you go deep. You know, as one, another reporter said to me at the Charles Stewart case, when we were all chasing Willie Bennett in the Roxbury, it's the husband. It's always the husband. <laughs> <laughs> This is off topic a bit, but associated. Did you ever do any investigative reporting on the old pier girl that was uh, found uh, found uh, cut in half? And Why does it? everybody remember that story? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone asked me about it. Bobby, City Hospital. Uh, Bobby Murner, who was the lead homicide investigator, was a friend of mine at yeah. that time. I was just wondering, you must That's have... the one we have tried every number one. I did not work it myself, yeah. but that it's amazing how people remember that case. Yeah. Uh, the poor one, the, probably the gruesome, the slaughter. But now we saw this one. Yeah, it's painful. Thank you. Sounds well, like another talk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, they may not be an answer to this, but Please. so her husband. 
allegedly or seemingly killed two men with two wives. I think they probably even maybe more, but go ahead. <laughs> Is there any insight at all about him or why? Anything that's going to be done about it? Shrooms. Shrooms. But he wrote that creepy little book. Yeah, there's a book out there, and if you look at Kathy Cowan's research, doesn't give uh, from some police enough credit. If you look at Kathy Curran's uh, piece on um, on YouTube, you'll see he wrote a, what was it called? Was it? Uh, oh, cooking with rump oil. Cooking with rump. It has all these sort of weird recipes. Weird recipes. Weird, like also about weird, like yeah. body parts. Yeah. Yeah. Double entendre. Yeah. yeah. There wasn't enough work done. They should have. He should have been locked up after. But they somehow did not have enough evidence to pin him to the murder of his previous wife, whose remains showed up in his septic system. Well, uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. Thank you for the library. <laughs>